Hello, and welcome to the Sustainable Adhesion Promoters and Automotive Coatings webinar presented by Eastman and ChemPoint. My name is Jeff Boyd. I'm the Marketing Manager for Coating Inks and Adhesives at ChemPoint, and I will be moderating today's presentation. Today's webinar features a live Q&A function. If you have questions during today's webinar, please submit them into the live Q&A. We'll take time at the end of the presentation to answer them. The Q&A window should be on the right side of your screen, but if you do not see it, please click on the icon in the top right corner of your screen that is a chat bubble with a question mark in the middle. In the live Q&A, there are two links I have shared that lead to polls relevant to today's presentation. Please take a moment and submit your answers when you have a chance. We will share the results of the polls later on in the presentation. Presenting today will be Tom Klug and Leslie Baker. Tom is the segment market manager for the Coatings and Inks Global Automotive business at Eastman. He has been with Eastman for seven years and is responsible for Eastman's global automotive OEM and refinished coatings business. Leslie is a technical service representative in the Coatings and Inks Tech Service Americas Group. She has been with Eastman for 18 years and her responsibilities include adhesion promoters and TetraShield resins for automotive and industrial markets. With that, I'll hand it over to Tom to begin the presentation. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for, uh, to yourself and to ChemPoint. Um, we're excited to uh, to share some or share this insight, some insights as well as uh, potential tips on uh, usage of adhesion promoters within automotive coatings. Um, let's be frank here, everyone. The world of automotive coatings is evolving. We've seen dramatic changes happening in the world uh, of automotive, whether it's adoption of battery electric vehicles, sustainability commitments from OEMs, and on top of that, evolving regulations. So we're excited to share how several of these trends are impacting the world of automotive coatings, whether you're in looking at production um, or refinish, and how you can leverage these insights uh, to pr both protect and grow your business going forward. A couple of housekeeping items just want to mention uh, uh, before we get started. One is be sure to leverage that Q&A function that's, uh, that you see in your upper right hand corner with a little question mark bubble. In that question mark, if you open that up right now, you'll see two, uh, two postings with links. This is an interactive presentation and one of the key pieces of this presentation is the live polling that we're going to have. So we encourage you to please just take a moment, uh, click both of those links and answer the polls. We're going to use them that information that's submitted um, will be aggregated and it's going to be part of this live presentation. So we will we'll have that as a as a as a piece to share um, here in the next little bit. So take a second, open that up, select the poll. It won't take more than a couple seconds to answer and uh, and we'll share that with you all shortly. Um, in addition to that, you know, this is a live uh, a, a lot kind of a live interaction function. We'd like uh, your questions, so please feel free to submit those questions and we're going to take it. We'll uh, take some time to answer those here at the end of the presentation. Now let's get started. Sustainability, that's a pretty broad word, right? Pretty broad term. It means a lot of things, so let's narrow that down real quick. When we think about the world of automotive coatings and the way that sustainability is impacting us, um, specifically for North, North America, we see a couple of variables that are at, that are changed that are you know have been changing for a while and are continuing to evolve. So when we think about the world of sustainability, there's kind of three areas that we want to double click into. The first is the evolve evolution of lower VOC solutions to be brought in for uh, that the coatings that the coatings industry is bringing. Safer chemistries, so the removal of APO uh, or uh, APOs from uh, chemical processes as well as just manufacturing in general, and recyclable content, bringing those solutions uh, into the autom into the automotive world. And it's not like these these things are conceptual or happening, you know, in the far distant future. These changes are happening right now as we speak. So let's take them one at a time and we'll start with low VOC solutions. So it's probably no surprise to anyone uh, on this call that Waterborne has been uh, a topic of uh, or a potential technology solution that's existed in the market for decades at this point. The movement from solvent-borne to waterborne is one that has been happening for many, many years, and we're seeing will continue to happen over the over the foreseeable future. But that movement is happening at a different rate and at, and has different penetration rates in depending on what application you're looking at. So in the world of OEM body for metal applications or interior plastics, there's been a tremendous amount of adoption for waterborne solutions in that space. Refinish has been one that's been growing and there's movement 
in the near at this point uh, for exterior pla as we think about exterior plastics, which still has some room to transition. When we think about the drivers here, it's not just there. There's certainly the regulatory drivers that are occurring on a on a on a state or even national level. But in addition to that, you can, we can we see that OEMs are beginning to make commitments to continue to reduce their VOC footprint in their manufacturing operations. So we fully believe that this is good, that this trend will continue um, as it has been for many years. Can go to the next slide. When we think about going beyond low VOC solutions, we think about safer chemistries. One area that we've been observing here recently, on definitely on a global level, is the removal of APOs from manufacturing processes. And if you're asking yourself, what in the world is an APO? An APO is a, is a, is a material that's been classified um, in many countries and even states as an endocrine disruptor. And so you see countries and or regions taking action to remove that from manufacturing processes. The first mover in this space was China. China specifically went in 2020 as a national directive, basically a memo just going and saying, you know, hey, let's go ahead and we advise that these materials not be used in, in manufacturing anymore, but it was not a mandate at that point in time. Over 2020, there was a, there were sunset dates for the EU uh, and, member, and, uh, and, uh, and member affiliate countries, as well as Korea to remove all APO chemistry from manufacturing processes, period. We also saw movement from companies like Ford who've gone to their suppliers and said we no longer want to, or we need to, these materials removed from our pro, or from our manufacturing lines now. So in 2021, certain re specific regions took action immediately to begin to remove those materials from their manufacturing processes. And when we think about the future, this trend isn't slowing down. And there's two ways that it, those of us in North America would, would begin to see this transpire. The first is you have multinational uh, conventions like the Rotterdam Convention, which has dozens of member states, including the United States and, that, and Canada for that matter, um, who will be reviewing APOs as uh, a, a material of concern over the next two to three years, which would lead to an out, which would lead to similar actions being taken at the state at the uh, the national level, uh, which could impact formulations today. Furthermore. When we think about going forward for those cut for, for formulators who are seeking not only to protect their business from future regulations but also expand into other regions it's important to know what those regulations are and apos are ones that uh, what removing apos will help you not only just protect your current business today in your country but also as you think about growing into other countries being a, being compliant with their rules and restrictions will allow you a smooth transition and capture that growth even faster and the last one, but certainly not least, is the emerging trend around recyclable content. So we see many OEMs going out and making very aggressive statements about how they're going to uh, begin to incorporate recyclable content or remove single-use materials from their uh, from their production streams. So a couple of examples. First, think about GM. They made recently made a commitment last year in their sustainability report to have up to 50% or greater than 50% of their total materials being used in their production line will be sustainable over the next 10 years. GM's not the only one, they're joined also by Ford, who's made commitments in the, again over the next 10 years to remove all single use plastics and, remove, and avoid materials being used in landfills. So when we kind of bring these together, next slide, Jeff. We think about how does the, how do these trends impact a, co a coatings formulator, or to anybody using material using these type or really just serving these uh, these OEMs in general, or even in the refinish space. There's a couple ways that you can adapt. When we think about low VOC trend solutions. It's really about optimizing VOC emissions to meet to be compliant with regulatory as well as meet OEM requirements. APO free chemistries need to take those out of the production process. And lastly, when we think about recyclable content, there's lots of ways to approach this. One, one first step could is uh, remove, using halogen-free materials for formulations so that they become much easier to recycle on the substrates that they're placed on. And when we think about, you know, how can I adapt and what solutions are out there for me? I want to direct that Eastman has a robust portfolio 
that can that can support you based on the area that matters most to you when it comes to your sustainability goals. So whether it's going and pursuing low VOC formulations, achieving uh, APO free in your in your chemistries, or even the full gambit and, and becoming a more having more recyclable uh, mater coatings material, we have a solution to be able to support you. And so now we're going to take a moment and we're going to kind of get some feedback real quick on on, the, on those live polls. So this is where you know your feedback is absolutely critical to us, and we want to share that feedback. So the first question is around uh, where are you focusing your sustainability efforts today? And you know this is insightful, right? We think about sustainability efforts, lots of low, lots of activity going on in low VOCs, uh, as well as removing banned substances. So that's insightful, right? And that's where we kind of think back to, you know, how can you be compliant? That waterborne applicant, waterborne is certainly one option um, to be able to support you in those low VOC solutions. And then APO free is one that, you know, is is quite a concern. It's an interesting one to deal with, but, um, you know, we our portfolio certainly supports both of those areas in particular. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our technical expert, Leslie Baker. And, and, and before I do that, just in case for those of you who um, maybe joined a few minutes late, um, wanted to call it, please feel free to use the chat function for Q&A. So it's that little, uh, little question mark bubble in the right hand corner. Um, submit a question and we'll look forward to answering that here uh, towards the end of the call. So thanks, Leslie. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Tom. Um, so when you look at a vehicle, whether that's interior or exterior, um, as you can see in this photo, there are many types of substrates that are used. Um, overall, plastics, um, they're mainly used for uh, weight reduction to increase, increase fuel efficiency. Uh, they're also used for design, flex, uh, design flexibility as well. Um, but the various types that are used are used for specific reasons. Um, an example will be uh, your headlights need clarity, so polycarbonate is used. Um, however, with the various types of substrates that you see right here, um, some are going to require help with getting adhesion to those substrates, uh, while others are not going to. So if we move to the next slide, we can um, look more closely at the types of plastics that usually require help for adhesion. Um, your thermosets, so these are generally flexible. Uh, they normally do not require adhesion promoters, whereas your thermoplastic substrates, so that your TPO, polypropylene, polyethylene based uh, substrates typically will require an, some sort of adhesion promotion method uh, to gain adhesion there. So another little poll, um, what are the specific types of substrates uh, you're typically working to uh, coat right now, whether um, they need adhesion or not. So let's see here. Some of the most common, so ABS is very common. Um, in the past, the uh, thermoplastic polyolefin polypropylene base have been uh, very popular. I still see that today, so uh, very good. All right, so let's look at how adhesion promoters are used. Um, they can be used in a couple of different ways. So whether that be a primer or additive. So if they're used as a primer, um, typically that can be uh, considered a standalone. And we also call that a wash primer where they're reduced down to um, five to 10% solids and uh, sprayed at the very low solids there um, at a low film build. So 0.1 to 0.3 mils is typical there. Or these can be sprayed um, when mixed with co-resins. The typical use level there is going to be a 5 to 20 percent adhesion promoter on resin solids. And then also uh, if they're used as an additive application, uh, normally they're dosed to a coating system at 5 to 30 percent ADPRO on resin solids of the coating. Um, and this can be um, like as a formulated primer or such when they're used in this manner. So, so very simple methods uh, to obtain the adhesion that you need. Next slide please. Um, so Tom spoke previously about uh, the types of products that we do have. So to support some of the sustainability efforts um, 
We've chosen three here to kind of highlight. I'll go over more of our portfolio in the following slides, but um, just want to point out some of the differences here between uh, the products. So um, CP310W and CP377W are a couple of our chlorinated products. They do defer in the weight percent CPO that they contain. Um, whereas the Advantage 510W is the non-chlorinated product. Um, all three of these products do defer in the neutralizing amine that's used. So 310W, um, the amine is ammonia. And um, people choose this product lots of times specifically for a primer because uh, the faster evaporating ammonia is going to make it useful. Um, that way the uh, solvent evaporates off of there uh, really quickly before the top coat application. So that's one reason that would be utilized as a primer. Um, the CP377W, it, it can be used as a primer or an additive application, whereas the Advantis 510W can as well. Um, going back to some of the composition there, um, I do want to point out that um, AMP95 is um, CP377W contains that, whereas uh, Advantis 510W uh, has the DMEA. Uh, and then also CP377W does have um, a little bit of organic solvent in there, around 2% ethylene glycol. So that's going to help with uh, freeze-thaw stability of the product and uh, as well as give you some flow properties there. All three products can be used um, as an additive or a primer. And generally, uh, they're all fairly compatible um, with some of your polyurethane dispersion uh, resins that are available. Um, I do want to highlight a couple of things about the Advantis 510W. So the chlorine-free nature uh, of that particular product uh, has the potential for better color consistency when it's added into some base coats. Um, and it, it also does give you great results when it's applied as a blending resin um, for uh, waterborne primers and base coats there. So, so overall, some, some really good uh, waterborne options that we have. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so when uh, we're speaking of performance between these products, um, the CP310W and the CP377W are generally very similar. Um, so all three of these products do have good adhesion after humidity and after water immersion. Uh, the 310 and 377W will have some uh, hurdles when it comes to fuel resistance um, and uh, are a little, they're average when it comes to the uh, Karcher high pressure water jet spray testing. Uh, overall, Advantis uh, has very good properties uh, in internal testing amongst all these uh, testing measures that we've completed. Next slide, please. So um, not only do we have uh, a robust portfolio of waterborne solutions, but we also have a, a nice selection of solvent-borne solutions as well. Um, at the top of the list here, you have all of our waterborne products listed. Uh, so um, speaking in terms of performance, uh, the 347 and 349W uh, will have similar performance to the 310 and 377W. Um, and then when we look down at our um, solvent borne options, uh, we have uh, five different options there. The differences in, differences in those are um, the one product, so the CP153-2, I will highlight that it is the one product uh, that we have for polyethylene-based substrates. And then the um, there are two products that we generally um, use as far as additive applications, and that is the CP343-3 and CP515-2 products. And, and the reason those are more suited for uh, the additive applications is because they do contain a um, higher chlorine content than, than the other products. Uh, the 730-1 is uh, what I consider one of our uh, workhorse products. Um, it has overall great properties, uh, very robust performance over um, with adhesion and uh, gasoline resistance properties. So, so it's an excellent choice uh, for automotive applications. And then we also have um, AP550-1, which um, is our one non-chlorinated product. And um, it's, it's a very good choice if you're using a, say, 2K urethane. Uh, top coat because it does have some residual hyd uh, hydroxyl functionality 
and it, it does uh, crosslink very well there and provides you excellent properties uh, under a 2k urethane top coat. So um, this is our product portfolio and uh, Jeff, I will turn it back over to you for questions. <clears throat> excellent. Thank you, Leslie, for all that information. Really good, good stuff. Uh, we do have a few questions here that have been published in the live Q&A. Uh, first one looks like it's for you, Leslie, but Tom, you might be able to chime in on this as well. It says, hi, Leslie, how are you seeing the market change in terms of substrate usage within the vehicle? Are some substrates increasing in volume over other? And Tom, I will let you uh, take that one. Yeah, absolutely. So um, maybe just to kind of direct, so I was reading recently from uh, with uh, an industry report from Auto Plastics, and they ranked uh, materials like polypropylene, polyethylene, nylon, and polyurethanes as as really over the past ten years they've experienced a lot of growth in terms of volume within the car. It, it, when we think about growth overall, it's around you know from a volume weight perspective in the vehicle, it's around like five to ten percent over the past 10 years. The areas that are kind of there we see shrinking, at least from that perspective, are in your PC, ABS, and PVC applications. So it, that was an interesting uh, insight when I think back to the poll that we uh, we looked at earlier, where you know there's a lot, looks like there's a lot of work being done in polypropylene as well as ABS, that you kind of see the two spectrums there where you know one material is being used quite a bit more in vehicles to date. And ABS, you know, according to that report, seems to be shrinking, but it seems like there's a little bit of work, uh, or there's quite a bit of work kind of continuing on in that air in that application space as a as a suitable substrate within vehicles for the future. So interesting to see that split. But um, from a vehicle net weight perspective, those polypropylene, polyethylene, nylon, um, and PU uh, materials uh, have historically been growing from a net weight perspective within the vehicle. Great, thanks, Tom. Uh, next one, probably for Leslie. Uh, can you explain the difference between using your products as a primer versus an additive? So, uh, so yeah, this this is going to be uh, very dependent upon your specific application. Um, and I, I will preface this with: uh, if anyone has any um, uh, questions specific for me, <clears throat> we can definitely connect offline. I know sometimes people don't want to talk about their specific applications and such. Um, in, in a live forum, but uh, but yeah, definitely connect with me offline if there's any uh, specific questions in your particular application. But uh, um, as I was going over the uh, product portfolio there with the uh, solvent born and um, waterborne options there, um, so with the solvent born products, uh, like I said, you can use um, as a wash primer and um, either as blended in with co resins. And uh, that would be just a kind of a one coat primer before any top coat application is, is the difference there. Whereas uh, when you're using these products as an additive, uh, you're gonna be adding it in uh, with other um, components of a uh, formulation. So that, that could be uh, conductive pigments or um, in, in a particular primer or such. But yeah, um, I, hope, I hope that answers the question, but uh, yeah, that's the, the differences there. Uh, but all the products, uh, like I say, if you want to connect with me offline, we can uh, discuss your application uh, more specifically uh, since these are are used in uh, in many different ways. So here's here's one that seems to always be the elephant in the room, right? The, someone's looking for some relative price info. So Tom, that's probably you. I'm not sure how much we can share on that without going into detail, but um, hand it over to you for that one. Yeah, no, I think uh, we certainly want to understand, you know, where's the material, uh, where's the material being used, but and more importantly, you know, how what, what's kind of that, but what's the the overall volume being used in that application. So, um, you know, difficult to give an indication here broadly, but we'd love to have that conversation uh, individually um, and through the right channel partner. Also, whether it's you know very significant or you know. Uh, we we have our you know a great partner over here with uh, with Kent Point who who can su support you on that. So we need to know a little bit more information before we could uh, we could give some of that directional price. But certainly you know Eastman historically has been a very a long term supplier of adhesion promoters within the market. We have a long history there, um, so we have good connect we have a good connection with the market. So it's one where you know we're 
we are competitive from that perspective. And there is a, the next slide does have some contact information on there for you. So if you do want to reach out to discuss uh, the project in more detail, um, please do so. Uh, next one is probably for Leslie again. Uh, it says, hello, how do the Eastman adhesion promoters work? What is the mechanism of adhesion, i.e. mechanical interlocking, electrostatic forces, chemical bonding, etc.? Yeah, so so these products work. Um, you have a, a nonpolar substrate. So the adhesion promoters have polar groups um, that can be um, maleic anhydride or um, carboxylic acid if the anhydride has opened up. Um, and that's going to uh, interact with the polar groups um, in the top coat. So, so there's a series of uh, Van der Waals forces and, and uh, with the polar groups uh, connecting there that uh, provides the adhes adhesion properties that you're, you're trying to achieve. Thanks. Here's an interesting one. I, how about polyester as a substrate? Do Eastman adhesion promoters work for water-based inks when polyester is the substrate for textile applications? So not necessarily automotive related, but uh, still adhesion promotion related. What was the first part of that question again there, Jeff? Sorry, I missed. That's okay. How about polyester as a substrate? Do Eastman adhesion, do Eastman adhesion promoters work for water-based inks when polyester is the substrate for textile applications? So, I am mostly automotive uh, focused. Um, however, these products do work in um, multiple markets. So um, inks as well, uh, textiles, um, I, I'm not sure. And Andy Sim, I see is on the phone. Um, he works a lot with the customers in the field. I will see if he has any uh, particular input there as, as feedback uh, from uh, some folks he's worked with in the past. OK, I'd be happy to, Leslie. So polyesters typically don't have the same type of adhesion issues as polyolefin substrates, polypropylene PPO. In fact, a lot of things have pretty good adhesion to polyesters uh, from the, the outset. The type of, of solvent or co-solvent in the case of a waterborne ink can certainly play a factor in, in, in the adhesion. The CPOs, it's Honest answer is it's it's going to be a trial and error. See if it helps you on a particular polyester substrate. I mean that the the substrate itself varies uh, considerably. Uh, one thing I would add to that, though, and, and you mentioned textiles, uh, we do have another line of products. We're talking about uh, adhesion promoters, but the um, our water-based polyester product line that is used in inks would have very good adhesion to to polyester substrates. Uh, they've also been used in, in textile sizing. So it's another product line that uh, could be considered here. And um, friends at Kim Point, uh, they also have those products available. And if you'd like to talk about that in more detail, I'd be happy to do that with you uh, offline. But with respect to the products that Leslie's talked about today, it would be uh, really a matter of, of an evaluation in your particular formula on that particular substrate. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. Uh, next one is, do you have case studies comparing your adhesion promoters with competitive chemistries? I don't know if maybe that's Leslie or Tom for that one. Yeah, yeah, that would be me. Um, so we do have internal evaluations against some of the uh, competition, and uh, that's on specific grades of particular uh, grades of polypropylene uh, TPO based plastics. Um, but yeah, what we we can make recommendations as to, um, I guess, general observations against how we performed uh, versus the competition. Uh, but yeah, I can definitely connect with folks um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, for some of that information as to uh, where I see one of our products and, and how they fit and uh, perform uh, versus the competition. But, but yeah, yeah, we do have some of that information available. Leslie, just a question for you on just sure. to follow up there. Any any high level takeaways when you think in your mind that are worth noting as far as when you think about the differences there? Um, so there are many different grades of uh, some yeah. of our competition for for sure, but uh, I would just have to probably 
Uh, we do perform very well against the uh, Trapolin and Hardland products. And, and if you're speaking of um, um, an automotive recommendation, uh, like I say, the CP730-1 uh, would be our workhorse product as far as um, versus um, the multiple grades of the competition that, that, that are available. That would be um, probably the one takeaway highlight, I would say, for automotive applications and versus the competition. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I got another one in here. Uh, can propylene carbonate be used as a curing additive on this adhesion promoter? Leslie, I'm going to defer can, to you on that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can propylene carbonate be used as a curing additive curing for this additive. adhesion promoter? So I, maybe can it be used to I, speed up or, or alter the cure speed? of the adhesion promoter, I'm, I'm assuming is what this person is wondering. Um, I don't have any experience with that. Andy, would you have any uh, feedback relative to that? Yeah, when I think of propylene carbonate, though, I, I think of it as, as a solvent. Um, and there are, uh, in some cases, uh, VOC exemptions for propylene carbonate. You know, if we're, if we're talking about the same thing here. Uh, so it's obviously gained a lot of attention as an, an exempt solvent, you know, versus the things that are typically used like oxal and, and acetone. So perhaps as a curing additive, maybe the question was was implying more as a, a co-solvent to, to just help overall film formation and integrity. I, I'm pretty certain we've not done any studies with that particular solvent with our waterborne CPOs. So, you know, it's a possibility, something um, to, to consider. But maybe a little clarification um, on the question would, would be helpful there. I, I'm assuming the interest would be relative to a VOC uh, reduction, but uh, I, I can only speculate on that. Okay. It said, yeah, that commission, uh, question was submitted by anonymous. Um, so, if, you know, if you've submitted that question and you'd like to add some more detail into the Q&A, we can, or uh, as we've mentioned multiple times, there'll be some contact information on the next slide. You can reach out to us and have a, a more one-on-one -on -one conversation. That's all I have right now for questions. So we'll kind of give it one last call for any more any more questions from the audience if we want to uh, keep the conversation going. Yeah. And, and while we're waiting, I you know, just want to extend a thank you out to uh, to the Kenpoint team, to Leslie and Andy, and then also to to you, the audience, for coming in, for joining us this afternoon or this morning, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, mm. We we enjoy sharing these type, having these kind of interactive discussions. We want to do more of these, and uh, that's you know this this crazy world that we live in right now with uh, kind of with, with more virtual interactions. Um, this is one format that we want to. We want to continue to share what insights that we can bring to the table or what we have. We're always looking at looking to see kind of what's happening downstream, whether it's in the refinished market, whether it's in the OEM space. Um, so we want to share those with uh, with the broader with the broader market and have these interactive discussions because together we can learn and, mm -hmm. and do better. So so thank you all. Sure. So Tom, let me add this? one additional uh, comment, and this is relative to the comparison question uh, between competitive adhesion promoters, um, and Le Leslie covered that. Certainly, there's a lot of good products out there. There's a lot of different adhesion promoters used in um, automotive market and, and others. And, and oftentimes, it's a matter of incumbency. What did someone start with? And then what did they formulate around? So it's you know not always easy to have a literal drop-in replacement on a one-to-one -one basis. But the point I'd like to add is the reason to think about Eastman products from the outset when you have an adhesion need. In addition to the performance is security of supply because that's one of the things we're known for. It's one of the things that is, is kind of a cornerstone of our, our value proposition. And, you know, these products, uh, or the competitive products are oftentimes uh, not made domestically, uh, supplied through distributors. And certainly at times there's, either long delays or, or, you know, security of supply issues with those. So I would leave with you, you know, our supply uh, security is, is one of the, the additional reasons you, you, you want to think about the Eastman line 
really first first when, you, when you're doing new development work. Thanks, Andy. So it looks like we have a follow-up for the uh, regarding the propylene carbonate. This person says, yes, it is VOC related. So um, I don't know if that uh, expands enough for you to, to continue on with that, but it looks like, yeah, they, they are interested in, in maybe using propylene carbonate as a VOC exempt solvent. Sure, yeah, that, that was the assumption. So I'm pretty certain we don't have any studies with that solvent in our waterborne CPOs. So maybe something we could uh, could do a quick uh, assessment on in the lab. Yeah, just theoretically, uh, as long as there's not hydrolysis going on with that particular solvent and, you know, as long as it's compatible, as far as its effect as a coalescent, um, it's hard to say. It's pretty slow evaporating, so it, it may be, you know, a possibility, but it's something we'd have to test. Okay. I think I've got another question here. Uh, would formula pH affect or degrade these types of adhesion promoters? So maybe, Leslie, that's a good one for you. I'm sorry, Jeff. Would formula pH affect or degrade these types of adhesion promoters? So does pH really matter when they're when they're formulating with these? Um, I haven't seen issues with that personally or heard of any feedback where that's an issue. Um, and these products are very stable products, so the pH does stay consistent uh, over time. Okay. Yeah, I haven't I haven't personally uh, had any problems or heard of any problems in that area. So we've got another question here. Uh, is there a water-based adhesion promoter for polyethylene substrates, a water version of CP-153? If not, is it in the works from your R&D? So um, we do not have a polyethylene-based version for uh, waterborne applications, and uh, currently that's not in the plans. And I would add on to that, we're, we're always looking for new areas to explore. So this is certainly an area that you know we're looking for feedback from the market to explore and see if this is if something we, we can uh, we can bring to the table to to support your needs. So it's uh, it's it's useful feedback if that's an area that that uh, that that folks are looking at, looking to support from an adhesion uh, adhesion perspective. So it's certainly yeah it's at this point it's not in the pipeline, but it doesn't mean that it can't be added and evaluated from our team. That, that's exactly right, Tom. If, if there is a need, um, that could be something that can be explored for sure. Okay, that's all we have right now for questions. Um, I'll just go ahead and click to the next slide here. Uh, sharing some contact information. Our market developer at ChemPoint, who's kind of our point person for these products. Uh, if you have questions that you'd like to have more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation about, uh, can reach out to Pamela and Pamela can put you in contact with the Eastman team, whether it be Leslie or Andy, uh, to kind of you know work through those questions, help you with formulation, um, and really discuss you know pricing and, and those types of, of things. So I'll leave that up on the screen there. Uh, we'll keep it live for a few more minutes in case there's any more questions. Uh, but let's I mentioned, please feel free to to reach out to us to have a, a more one-on-one -on -one conversation if that's uh, better suited for for your application. All right. I just want to thank everyone on the on the calls attendees for for joining us today for this live webinar. Uh, thank everyone from the Eastman team here as well for sharing some really valuable information. I believe the in, intent for this uh, webinar we've recorded it, so it should be able, uh, available uh, via the Kempoint YouTube channel, maybe the Eastman YouTube channel at some point, and, and post it onto our website as well. So in case you want to rewatch it uh, and, and glean any more of the information from the presentation, it will be available. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yes, Looking forward you. to speaking with you all again soon. All right.